Hi, guys. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ken Van Mersbergen, and I'm presenting the history of Rockland Corporation. So let's uh, delve right into it. Now, this is my first presentation for um, Vintage Gaming Festivals, so forgive me if I'm a little rusty. First, we'll start with the question, what was Rockland Corporation? Well, Rockland Corporation was first started in the mid-70s as a management consulting firm run by one guy. Larry Gabriel. Our story starts uh, in 1980 uh, when Ronald Borta arrived at Rockland. Rockland's first address was 10,600 West Higgins Road in Rosemont, Illinois. That's what the building looks like today. It's the O'Hare Corporate Tower. When they were a management consulting company and they, when they first started getting into software projects, this was their headquarters. But uh, it turned out to be a too small a space for the growing company. So they moved to Arlington Heights. And this was their last location. Pretty much just, uh, just an office. The people who used the office, though, was just management and marketing and sales. Uh, the programmers weren't there. They, worked, they pioneered working from home back in 1980. Let's, let's talk about Ronald Borda for a little bit. Uh, he started in field service for a company called OSE, which is a big international conglomerate. Uh, he was working on a training program on a mainframe computer when he discovered the game Star Trek. And he got addicted to playing Star Trek. And he wanted to play it at home, which he couldn't do. He didn't have a mainframe computer. So when he left OSE, he worked at a company called Northrop in the Defense Systems Division. And he ran into a guy named Todd Zipnick. And together they worked out that for them to achieve what they really wanted, they needed to form their own company. So they founded a company called GACC. Now, does anybody here know what GACC stood for? You're know, like this. Just another computer company. Which I thought was a pretty good name for a company. That's what they called it. Just another computer company. Now, he had a contact at the SRA division of IBM to make educational software for the Atari 800. Atari wanted to sell more computers in bulk, and the way to do that was to get into education. But they didn't have any educational software at that time. So they contracted IBM, who then subcontracted to JACC for educational software. And they wrote uh, States and Capitals and Atlas of Canada for Atari, cassette-based software. And uh, another thing he made was a memory module for the Atari after he was at a, at a presentation of the Atari 100 computer. And the guy from Atari said, this is a closed system, okay? No one but Atari has the expertise and the talent to make an add-on for this system. So uh, Ron went home and made this. This is a 16K memory module and he sold it for half the price of Atari's module. And he did it just to spite them, really, just to annoy them. If you notice over here, it says right there on the board, JACC, Ron Borda, 1980. I have this board at my table out in the display area. I've never seen another one like it, so I don't know how rare it is, but that's the board he made, sold at half the price of Atari's. It was not in a plastic case like theirs, but it worked. We'll start with 1980. Ron uh, moves and starts working for Rockland Corporation. And when he got there, he started the Computer Technology Group, which not long after became known as Rockland Software, which is what we're going to spend the majority of our time talking about today. First, I'll start with the development system they used at Rockland to develop the software. Now, I, said, now I told you before, the software programmers, they worked from home. So they had to have a development system at home. And what did they use? Well, the Atari 800 computer. A modified Atari 800 computer, I'll show you a bit later. And also, to write the software and compile it, they used Atari Macro Assembler. It was a pretty powerful program for the time. They developed all their Atari 800, 2600, and 5200 games using Atari Macro Assembler in the Atari 800. And every program have a copy of this. It's hard to make out that label up there, I know. But um, what it basically says is development system version five. 
Then what was on that disc, you ask? Well, here we go. Those are all the tools they use for development. Medit was the Atari program text editor. That's where they wrote their code. Uh, init was just to initialize a disk. That's basically what it is. The PAD is Programmer's Advanced Disk Editor. If there's a problem with the disk, they use that to fix a problem, especially if it, was, if it was their only copy of the code or game, they had to fix it. And copy does exactly what that, oh, AMAC, that's the Atari Macro Assembler. That's the assembler itself they had on there. Copy, just copy the file from one disk to another. GTEC was the program for their EEPROM programmer they connected to the Atari 800, something else they had at home to burn EEPROMs to put on cartridges so they could get the games to, to, the, to the vendors that requested them. P-Hook, we're not sure what P-Hook is, and no one I've talked to at Rockland remembers what it was for, so maybe next year I'll have the answer for that one. Uh, dupe Disk does exactly what it says, copies the disk. DTS is data to source. They used a graphics program, and the graphics program they wrote using would convert the graphics data to macro assembler compatible source, and they used DTS to do it. RS-232 and Emul8, Emulate is related to the ROM emulator that they had at home also for, for the development system. You know, those, I can't get those to run at all. They just crash the Atari because I don't have the necessary hardware attached to make it work. And Bug65 is a debugger, and Sector Copy would copy a sector of a disk. As I said, they used a modified 800. On the back of their 800s was, they, made, they added a serial port. And they connected the serial port to the other system they had at home, an S100 system. In that S100 system was a custom card made by Rockland called a ROM emulator. So they'd send the program to the ROM emulator and plug the ROM emulator into the cartridge slot of the system they were programming for so they could instantly test their game code without having to burn an EEPROM or make a cartridge. They saved EEPROM burning for final testing or games they have to ship out to the vendor to test and make sure it was okay. They didn't want to waste EEPROMs. They were expensive back then. So they used the, the ROM emulator. And the mantra of Rockland was, if we didn't have it, we made it. And they did that a lot. If it didn't exist, they created it. Like the ROM, the ROM emulator, they built that S100 card. They engineered the text at Rockland. They built that. And here's something else they did. So the 2600, they added a video port. Standard Atari five pin monitor port and plug that in and they got a much better picture. They modified all of their game systems this way. I found a ColecoVision with this mod, a 5200 with this mod, an Intellivision with this mod. All of it had, had this mod on it. That they do it. I guess they get, if you get five of them in a room together, this is what they end up doing. <laughs> now we'll start with the products that Rockland created. A lot of, we'll start with the self-published ones before we get on to the others. But uh, Ron Borda had the idea, if I wasn't the first with this idea, of porting arcade games to home computers. He thought that'd be a tremendous market because he was addicted to Star Trek on the mainframe. And that was a text-based game. And he, and he liked it. So he went to Midway and he talked with Dave Morofsky. That might be a familiar name to some of you. And when he was talking to Dave, Dave said, and I quote, why the heck would anyone want to play an arcade game at home? But... Uh, Ron wanted the rights to Space Invaders, Pac-Man, Wizard of War, and Gorf, and any others he could get. But um, Dave had to tell him that Atari had the Pac-Man rights, so he couldn't get that one. Ron was a little bummed about that one. He wanted that one. And they didn't really have the actual rights to Space Invaders either, really. So he got Wizard of War and Gorf, though, from him. Because uh, Dave felt so bad that he couldn't get the two games he really wanted to get first. So he gave him a pretty sweet deal on the license for Wizard of War and Gorf. So they developed their own version of Space Invaders, Deluxe Invaders. And this is actually a much better Space Invaders game than Atari's own Space Invaders for the Atari computers. And this was programmed by Joe Helson. And they marketed this as Deluxe Invaders. I think it did pretty well. It was a very good game. If you haven't played it, I, I suggest you get a copy and play it. Uh, they also had a version in the works for the 5200. But uh, I've only found three of the four EEPROMs necessary for the game to work. I'm hoping the other one will show up someday. But um, in the archive I had access to, only three of them showed up. It looked like they had a plan to put it on the 5200, but it didn't happen for whatever reason. And they released Gorf and Wizard of War. 
Gorf, uh, we believe, was programmed either by Joe Wagner or Cameron Schaefer. I couldn't get confirmation on that. Uh, Wizards of War was programmed by Joe Hellison and Joe Wagner. Now, when programmers, programmers worked together, they'd go to each other's houses. That's how that worked. They didn't come into the office. They, they didn't program there. So they spent time at each other's houses. Also, they got uh, full-size arcade games to help them with the program. They had a Wizards of War arcade machine in his house when, he, when they made the game. Now let's move on to, there was a company called Techstar that many of you not, may not have heard of. Uh, they were going to create arcade games. And Rockland somehow found out about them. And they got the rights to do home versions of any arcade games that they would create. So the first one was called Defuzz. And that was programmed by Tim Weller. And this game was finished, but not released. And the other one they got from Techstar was Rock Ball. Now, I premiered Rock Ball two years ago here at, uh, here at the festival. It was the first time it was shown in public ever, because no one has ever seen it before. Rock Ball was programmed by Anthony Weber, and they did have Commodore 64 versions of both games in the works. I did find uh, prototypes for both. So, but uh, once again, the 64 versions, nor the Atari versions were ever released, but box art was created for them. And let's move on to JB Software. JB Software was Jack Verson's company. Now, he had released these games years prior under his own label, but he didn't have the marketing or distribution power. So when Rockland brought him in, Rockland got the rights to publish Jack's software. And Journey to the Planets was published, and they combined two of his games, Action Quest and Ghost Encounters, as Castle Hassle. And they had Commodore versions of these two also in the works. I know Castle Hassle was released for the 64. I don't believe Journey to the Planets was, but it was planned. And they did some work for Scott's Forsman games. They did Star Maze, extremely rare game. That did, it did come out in limited number for the Atari. And they also did Lifespan by a company called Flight of Fancy. This game was in constant change. They kept submitting changes all the way to the last minute until Ron decided, that's it. Whatever they give us next, we're going with Final Code. That's it. We're done. So the version that's out there, I did release this too a couple of years ago, is, is the final version. Is it really the final? We don't really know. But it's the, it's the version that Ron said, we're done. This is it. Then there was Itzy. Itzy was two army guys in New Mexico. They were, they were, they were in the army. And they were pretty good programmers, too, because they wrote Diamond Mine for the Atari and the Commodore 64, and also Rack 'em Up. Now, I don't know if any of you guys have played Rack 'em Up on the Atari or the Commodore, but the ball physics are pretty amazing. So these guys were, were pretty good. But so I think those are the only two uh, games. I don't think that's two, the only two games that they wrote, but it's the only two that Rockland published for them. And they also, I think, made it for the Apple II as well for that, for that particular market. And they did have a utility in the works called AID, the Absolute Disk Editor, which was the commercial version of the programmer's editor that they had on their development disk. And those are all the features they had built into it. So that's, that's, that's a pretty good package there. Pretty much everything you possibly want to do with the disc is there. Then they did have one business product that was destined for business. It's called Autogrammer. And Ron actually started working on this when he was at JACC, but he didn't finish it or patent it until he got a Rockland. So it is a Rockland product. Uh, what Autogrammer is, do you ask? Well, basically, Autogrammer is a program creator. Basically, you would put in the specs of what you wanted the program to do, and Autogrammer would create the machine language program for you. Pretty neat. And they get sold for $300. And they had versions for the, uh, they had a CPM version available and ones for the TRS-80. Other versions were planned, but they were not implemented. So an Autogrammer, I think, sold pretty well for them. Although, as Ron told me, uh, someone uh, used Autogrammer to create an application generator program, <laughs> an application maker. So you can use one to make the other, I guess, a cart before the horse type of thing. Let's start with the companies that they did contract work for. Let's start with the big one, Atari. Now, Ron still had his contacts from Atari through IBM's SRA division, and he maintained those contacts when he got to Rockland. And Atari did contact him about doing a game they contacted him and said, we have this game that we got the rights to, this arcade game, and we want you guys to develop it for the, our Atari computers. 
And Matt says, okay, what is it? Well, it's called Pac-Man. The very game that Ron tried to get from Midway, he said, you guys stole this from me. Come on, guys. And so I said, okay, well, how much do you want to do the conversion? Ron just thought of a number off the top of his head. He said, okay, I'll do it for $25,000, which I guess back then was a big sum of money. Honestly, I think if he asked for 50, he probably could have got it because they wanted him, uh, Rockland, to develop the game. And the game was programmed by Joe Helson with help from Joe Gachet. And they did have a Pac-Man machine delivered to uh, Joe Helson's house. That was part of that. I guess he was part of the 25K for that. And basically, they, they played that game, and they made, if you guys have played the Atari version of Pac-Man, it's a very good version of the game. They spent a lot of time on it. And uh, Joe Helson actually did disassemble the, the Z80 ROMs. He did that for the data tables on the monster movement and the rules of the game. And he implemented those in his version. Now, I'll show by example. Now, there's the arcade game, okay? Now, which one looks better? Be honest now. Which one looks more like the arcade game? If it chose this one, you're correct. That's the Rockland version. Atari did convert it for the 5200 later. That was James Andresen who did that conversion, but they, just, they took the Rockland code, put it on the 5200, they added the intermissions, and they sped up the game a little bit. But it is, uh, at heart, it is the Rockland version. And basically, they just took the game. They made it spread out for the TV screen of the time, the 4.3 range, but the game plays really well. I still play it every once in a while now. It's a really, really good game. And nobody knew at the time that Atari didn't program it, that it was the guys at Rockland. What, what, what Joe Gachet did, he was brought in to compress the game because it was too big for an 8K cartridge. So he compressed the game, he put in compression techniques to compress the game down to 8K. And when you put the cartridge in the computer and turn it on, the first thing the game does, it expands itself and puts itself into memory. That's all Rockland code. So, and this, what Ron Borda told me, he told me the 25,000 that he got from Atari for doing Pac-Man turned out to be the best investment he ever made. Because that started their working relationship with Atari. And it continued for a few years. And after that project, Joe Gachet was given the title of 2600 programmer. So he had to figure out how to program the 2600. So the first thing project he worked on was a project called Racer. And it looks like that. Basically, he was trying to see if he could write a pole position type game. This was basically his in-house demo. See if he could, one, if he could program the 2600, and two, if he could program a Z-plane racing game. Now, they did send him to Atari, and he met with a program named Carla Maninsky, who at the time was working on the 2600 version of Tempest. And he showed his, her code to Joe to see how Z-plane coding worked. And uh, what Joe told me, she was a phenomenal programmer. He learned a lot from her when they sent him to Atari. And this was done, as I said, an in-house project to see if he could write the game. Uh, Ron Borda saw it and tried to sell it to Atari because Ron was all about money. We can sell that. No, 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 Ron. It's a demo. It's a demo. But he, uh, he made him put the Atari logo down there <laughs> on it, and he tried to sell it to Atari, but Atari didn't bite on it. They didn't want it. And there's a game for twins called Firefox based on the Clint Eastwood movie. The screenshots there. This was programmed by Bob Curtis. Bob Curtis came over from Ballet Midway as a 2600 programmer. He told me he wanted to work for Rockland because he wanted to work from home. He didn't want to go in the office anymore. Working from home, believe it or not, was a great attraction back then. We experienced it a few years ago, most of us. And the programmers for Rockland absolutely loved it. They didn't have to show up nine to five. They could work whatever they wanted, work their own schedule. All Ron wanted was the game done within about five, six months. And if you're wondering how they got things to one another, there was, a, there was a field tech that actually did that. And he would go from house to house. He would fix the machine, he would fix the development systems, run the updates on them, and also ferry the eight-inch disks from uh, the office to, to, to the programmer with final code and any changes that, that might have been made. So, so the first project they, they gave to Joe, was they had a contract with Atari to produce a home port of Crazy Climber for the 2600. And he started work on that, but about he got the buildings done and the data tables done, and then uh, Alex Levins joined Rockland. He also worked at Bally Midway for 2600 programming, and basically he handed Crazy Climber off to to Alex to do. 
And as Joe told me, Alex lived on the south side of Chicago and he lived on the north side. So he had to commute back and forth showing Alex what to do and tell him what he already had done with Crazy Climber. And then once he was comfortable, he went to work on another project for Atari, Real Sports Basketball. That was a Rockland product. Now, he, Joe started working on basketball. Then one day, Ron shows up at Joe's door in a panic. He said, Alex quit. He moved to California. Crazy Climber's not done. Atari needs it. You got to finish it. And Joe's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Come on, time out. <laughs> wait, wait, what are you talking about now? So first he had to go to Alex's apartment, break in, and get, and get the software, get the disc that had the, the Crazy Climber code on it. Because he left everything behind when he left. He just up and left. We really don't know what happened, I guess. Uh, from what we theorize, he started working as a freelance programmer. Alex Levins did in California. He wrote a few other, other 2600 games after that. He just, I guess he liked working as a freelance programmer and not for a company. But he kind of left him in the lurch. So as Joe explained, he's like, I knew the data tables because I wrote them, but I didn't know any of the code that Alex had done. So we dove into it. He was working on that, and he's working on basketball. He's working on this. He's working on basketball. He's working on both, and he's just about approaching burnout. Because it's tough to program a 2600 game if you've never done it before. It's really difficult to do. And he's, he's juggling both projects right now. He's the only 2600 programmer Rockland has right now. So he got Crazy Clamor to a point where it was playable and it didn't crash. And Rod said, once again, we're going, this, we're going with final code on this. We're going with final code. We're going to send this to Atari. Don't make him happy. Now, there is a bug still in the game, but no one's ever found it. All I'll tell you is it happens on Building 11. So, but as far as I can tell, no one's ever found it. But with basketball, Joe just, um, he just burned out. He gave up on it. He stopped working on it in January of 83. It was just it. He just couldn't do it anymore. So uh, I think they, they, once again, Ron tried to process it as final code for Atari, and Atari just wasn't biting on that one either. It, was, it wasn't good enough. So the prototype is out there, and it plays okay, but there's several problems with it. It wasn't really finished. So then they did some work for Atari Soft. Jaws for the Commodore 64. Look, look pretty good, I thought. Now, the story on this is kind of interesting. Uh, Jack Verston worked on this. Originally, they had a programmer, Rock and Hire, to work on Jaws for the Commodore 64, said he could do the game in about five months. But five months later, he had nothing to show for it. He had nothing. So Jack said, well, I'll do it for you in three weeks. How's he going to do it? Well... What he did was, he said, do you have a, give me a copy of the Atari 800 version. So Jack disassembled the Atari 8-bit version, got it to reassemble, then made his changes to make it run on the Commodore 64. And that fulfilled the contract with, with Atari. But a little twist happened. At CES, the programmer of the Atari 800 version of Joust, uh, uh, Steve Zemanski, saw the Commodore version and his version and noticed they were running identical code. <laughs> like, That's my code, but I didn't write the Commodore version. So he was really mad. He went up to Atari and said, you, you, you got to pay me for that one, because I wrote that one. Like, no, you didn't. That's my code. So Atari did end up paying him for both the Atari 800 version and the Commodore 64 version, and paying Rockland for their version as well. I think ultimately they didn't release it, because I guess, I guess maybe royalties would have been a nightmare. So they ultimately, they did not release Joust for the Commodore 64. And all, the other thing was it also had all the bugs that the Atari 800 version had because they just poured it straight over. And uh, honestly, I think the Commodore probably could have done a, bit, a lot better than what you see here if it programmed properly, but um, they needed a game quickly. And he did do it in three weeks like he promised. And also they had Robotron 2084 for the ti 994 a programmed by Bill Parade. Not a bad version. Ultimately unreleased as well. I think Rockland, uh, we'll get to that point of that, uh, by that point in the story, but ultimately was unreleased. But the prototype is out there. And they also did some work for Disney and Atari. Mickey and the Great Outdoors. Rockland programmed that. Uh, once again, we're not sure who programmed that, but it was a product that Rockland created for Atari and Disney. Disney didn't really want uh, their characters in a game program because they felt that computers couldn't actually portray their characters. But when they saw the Rockland demo, they approved it. And another company they did work for was Coleco. Now, the funny story about Coleco and Rockland, Ron did not want this contract. 
Main reason is they wanted him to program for the Intellivision. And he had no programmers on staff with any experience programming the Intellivision. So he did not want the Clico contract, but Clico kept calling and calling, really wanted him to get. So he gave him an insane amount of money to do it. He didn't tell me what the amount was, but it was a really, really high number. He felt that, okay, they'll go away. They're going to go away. They're not going to take the contract. Well, not to be outdone, Clico said, okay, you got it. He's like, oh, man, <laughs> now I got to do these games. So he had to find a programmer that could program the Intellivision. He did a really, really, really high number, but, and there's the infamous Donkey Kong for Intellivision. Frank Johnson was the programmer. And as I said, in his defense, he had no experience programming the Intellivision. This was his first effort, and it was not really very good. But he also did Donkey Kong Jr., Carnival, Mousetrap, and Zaxxon. But if you look at the games, he did get better as he went along. Zaxxon turned out to be better than Donkey Kong. Mousetrap wasn't too bad as he was learning how to program the Intellivision. And he had to do it also, remember, without any of Mattel's code, without any of Mattel's tricks or secrets. They had to do it himself. So that's another difficult hurdle they, hit, they had. But they did it. I think he said the first royalty check he got from uh, Coleco was about $600,000 for those games that he did, that he originally didn't want to do. But, and the one company they did a lot of work for was Parker Brothers. They had a really good working relationship with Parker Brothers. Um, I think I forgot to mention earlier. When Atari showed Pac-Man at CES, the reason why they got all this work was that at the, after they showed it at CES, they told everyone who did it for them. That it was Rockland Corporation of Arlington Heights, Illinois. And that's when they started to get all these contracts rolling in. Parker Brothers, for Parker Brothers, they did... Super Cobra for the 2600, programmed by Paul Crowley and Bob Curtis. And they also did the Atari computer version of Super Cobra, programmed by Ed Schneider. Did the Commodore 64 version of Qbert was a Rockland product. Unknown who did it, uh, but Joe Helson was their main Commodore 64 programmer, but he told me he did not do Qbert. So they also did games for the Commodore VIC 20. They did a version of Frogger. And Qbert. Both games programmed by Paul Crowley. And of course, they also did the Intellivision games. Now, by now, they got pretty good at it. Paul Crowley programmed Frogger for the Intellivision. Frank Johnson did the rest. By Qbert, Super Cobra, Tutankham, and Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. All in television versions. And then they got a pretty hefty royalty check from Parker Brothers as well, in excess of $800,000. Because these games sold really well. And CBS video games. Now, CBS got the console rights to Gorf and Wizard of War. But they contacted Rockland for expertise on programming those games because they had done the computer versions. And CBS wanted to do 5200 versions, and that was an easy conversion from the Atari computers to the 5200 of their existing game. So they did Gorf, programmed by Joe Gachet, and Wizard of War for the 2600, programmed by Joe Helson and Joe Wagner. And once again, they were given arcade games. Joe had a Gorf machine installed in his house, and they still had the Wizard of War machine from the time they did the 800 version. And since it is Sunday, I'll show you a little bit of the advertising CBS did for Wizard of War. I'm John Madden for CBS Video Games. I've got a great money-back offer for you. But first, watch this exciting competition in the CBS Video Games Challenge of Champions. Today's challengers, arcade aces, Tony Sarkis against Ray Johnson. The game, Wizard of War, new from CBS Video Games. The object, defeat the wizard, his henchman, and your opponent. Tony hits water. He misses Ray. Ray fires at the wizard. Wizard zap Tony. Ray Johnson wins. Wizard of War, new from CBS Video Games. Are you up to the challenge? You've seen how challenging Wizard of War is. Now we'll bet you money back that Wizard is tougher than you are. Buy it, and after three days, if you think otherwise, return it to your participating dealer with your receipt and get your money back. How can we make this money back offer? Because we know how tough this game is. But maybe you're not up to the challenge. 
Yes, John Madden worked for CBS, as you know, in those days. And as a result, he did a lot of the advertising for CBS video games. As they were the same company, just another division. And they did 5200 versions of Gorf and Wizard of War. Wizard of War was programmed by the same two guys, Joe Helson and Joe Wagner, you know, showing their versatility. Gorf, uh, we believe, is probably Joe Wagner, but it could have been Cameron Schaefer as well. We don't really know who programmed Gorf for, the, for them. And some others they did for some other companies. They did Cave of the Word Wizard for Commodore 64 for Timeworks, programmed by Patrick Quinn. Uh, and there's speech in this game as well. But it's a pretty cool game if you haven't played it. And they did BC's Quest for Tires for the IBM for Sierra Online. And, and again, it's unknown who worked on that project for Rockland. And they did do some other games for the Atari 400 800. I don't have images for them, but uh, here are the other anti sub patrol, the other division for Scott Forsman, uh, Cheese Whiz, and Crazy Maze Race for unreleased. I believe those were original games. Uh, Donald Duck for Disney, not finished, unreleased. A uh, uh, conversion of the arcade game Eyes. As far as I was told, it was finished, but we haven't found it yet. A Firefox, a uh, version of Firefox game for the 800. They were on Frog Jump and Number Bowling. Uh, Gyrus for the Atari 800, originally being programmed by Anthony Weber, but Rockland's version did not see release. Uh, Peter, uh, three or four Peter Pan games for Disney also were planned. Picture Parts and Space Journey for the Atari 800. Pyramid Puzzler for Apple II on the Atari 800. Uh, Reading Flight and Scouter, also ultimately unreleased. Now, the one unreleased game I keep getting asked about that Rockland did versions for, Pursuit of the Pink Panther. Get a lot of questions on this one. Now, Rockland did work on two versions of the Pink Panther game, one for the VIC-20 and one for the Atari 800. Now, the VIC-20 version, we believe, was probably Paul Crowley, what we don't know. He doesn't remember if he did that. It turned out it's only a one-screen demo was the only uh, work that was done on the VIC-20, and that's what it shows when you boot it up. That's it. The Atari 800 version was playable, I don't believe it was finished. There's a photo of the EEPROM car for the 800 version with a date of 921. I believe that's 83. And there's the VIC-20 card. Now, I have the, the VIC-20 card. Unfortunately, I do not have this one. We're hoping it services again. But they did work on versions for the 800 and the VIC-20. And now the big question, what happened to Rockland after that? Seems they were going along pretty good, right? Writing games for the industry. The industry was booming at that time, and they were creating a lot of the software that was being sold by the different companies. And they're getting pretty good at it. Well, about, I would say, mid to late 83, uh, Motorola sued Rockland for breach of contract. Basically, what happened was they were purchasing their EPRON trips from Motorola, but they didn't, they paid for half the order, but Motorola did not deliver the chips. So Rockland couldn't send any of their versions or publish any software without those chips. So from what we theorize, it looks like Motorola intentionally was targeting Rockland for whatever reason. We're not really sure. But um, since they couldn't make any money by selling games or giving copies of games to the, to the companies to, to try to get money paid, uh, they couldn't do anything. So Motorola sued them. Uh, Rockland filed for bankruptcy in about late 83. Um, and they sent a bunch of liquidators to Rockland headquarters, but most of the items, as you know, were in the programmers' homes because they worked at home. So they didn't get much, quite honestly. So our story continues, though, a little bit. But what happened after that? Well, um, sometime in late 83, uh, Lewis Marble, who, was the, who worked for Parker Brothers, who was the contact for Rockland, he was the liaison between Parker Brothers and Rockland, uh, comes to Joe Gachet's house. In a panic. Seems to be a common thing at Joe's house at this time. And he says, Joe, you got to form your own company. It's like, why? Rockland's gone. Rockland's dead. Rockland's gone. And I have contracts for these games. These games have to be made. I have $180,000 in contracts. So he says, okay, pick your, your best people, your best programmers, form a company, and let's get these games done. So Joe picked three of his Best programmers and friends, Joe Gachet, Paul Crowley, Cameron Schaefer, and Jack Verson formed a company called On Time Software. The reason they called it On Time is because when they worked for Rockland, all their deliverables were always delivered to their contractors on time, every time. So, but Parker Brothers, the upper management of Parker Brothers was a little concerned about On Time Software 
being really a division of Rockland. And with Motorola's lawsuit out there, they really didn't want anything to do with it. So Jack Verson had to send a letter to Parker Brothers, to, I guess it's, a, is it the name is Jerry Connolly, I guess it was a VP somewhere. And I don't know if you guys can read that, but it says, I am pleased to introduce our California-based company, On Time Software. They incorporated in California to also throw it because between Illinois and California, it was easier to incorporate in California. Two of the guys worked in California, Jack Verston and Cameron Schaefer. Two guys worked in Illinois, Paul Crowley and Joe Gachet. But the company was incorporated in California. I believe that's their first headquarters, uh, the office that they use on Mark Avenue in Santa Clara. This letter was written in November 15th, 83. So the late 83 timeline fits with that. And chartered to provide contract programming software for the home video game machine and home computer market. All of our affiliates have previous experience in software development for this market, and our joint expertise include products for the Atari 2600, 4800, 5200, Commodore 64, VIC 20, and ColecoVision, as well as knowledge of other computers such as the IBM PC. Through Parker Brothers representative Lewis Marble, we have been made aware of the requirements for a James Bond game on the Atari 2600, 4800, 5200, Commodore 64, and ColecoVision. In coordinating with Mr. Marble, we have been developing software for this product and are interested in continuing this work. We are confident that this product for all machines can be delivered in time adequate for your presentation at the Las Vegas CES show in January 1984. We are also extremely interested in continuing to work with Parker Brothers on similar products in the near future. You have shown some concern over possible affiliation between OnTime Software and Rockland Corporation of Arlington Heights, Illinois. I am not affiliated or employed at Rockland Software, and no other personnel working on the James Bond project are associated in any way. That's not a lie. That was true. Rocket was gone. They all resigned before this happened. <laughs> so they are not associated. They used to work for Rockland, but they're not associated with them. So we look forward to providing you with a timely and quality James Bond product and, and forward to establishing a long-term relationship with Parker Brothers. Require any other information, I can be reached in California. For a truly yours, Jack Averson, Vice President. They obviously accepted that because they started work on Parker, for Parker Brothers again on uh, some titles. First one, of course, being James Bond 007 for the Atari 2600, programmed by Joe Gachet and Paul Crowley. And they also did a version of Mr. Dew's Castle for the Atari 2600, although they're not sure who did Mr. Dew's Castle. Uh, from what I was told, they outsourced that to another company, but they cannot remember at this time what the company was. But uh, James Bond 007 for the 2600 was not really a good game. And Lewis know that, knew that, and he told Joe, I know you're better than this. You're a way better programmer. Show me you can do better with these other projects. So the first one he did after that, Gyrus for the 2600, which if anyone has played it, the 2600 version is a really good version of it. They spent a lot of time on the music. They realized early on in development that the music was very important to this game. So the 2600 version has the music, but no sound effects. They figured, they said, they said the music was much more important. And the music was developed by Dan Krzyzewski, who used to work for Parker Brothers. And they spent a lot of time on that music. And then he also did a version of Popeye. And he had a Popeye arcade game in his house. Now, he started working on Popeye at Rockland near the end. When he took his code, he still had his code at home. He just finished the game for on-time software. Once again, these, these two are considered some pretty, really, really good 2600 versions of the game. Joe came through with these two, with these two games. And they also did versions for the 5200, Gyrus, and James Bond, both programmed by Jack Verson. They also did Mr. Deuce Castle. Jack didn't do Mr. Deuce Castle, and they're not sure who did. Another outsourced job. On time, did outsource work to other companies, just that no one ever wrote anything down for that. So. And, of course, the computer versions from Gyrus, James Bond, and Mr. Deuce Castle for Comics 4 and the Atari computers. Jack Verson did the computer versions of Gyrus and James Bond. And so we don't know who did Mr. Deuce Castle for the Commodore or the Atari at this point. And of course, they did it for ColecoVision also. And these were programmed by Paul Crowley. And Mr. Deuce Castle again, we believed it was Paul Crowley, but he doesn't remember doing this, but he said, it is possible. <laughs> so, but... He also did Up and Down for Bally Midway for ColecoVision. That was done by On Time Software. And the Commodore 64 version of Gyrus was programmed by former Rockland employee Joe Helson. He had his own software company even back then called Windy City Software. 
and they outsourced Jairus to him. And they also did James Bond. Popeye was done. Uh, Jack Verson wrote a version of Popeye for the Atari 800, once, uh, for the Commodore. Once again, it was converted from the Atari 800 version. Uh, Parker Brothers didn't like that version, so they outsourced that. Uh, they gave the contract to Western Technologies, who released the final version of Popeye for the, Atari, for the, for the Commodore 64. And Paul Crowley did math quests for Coleco for the Atom originally. Uh, Collector Vision uh, released this now for the Coleco Vision and Atom now. Paul Crowley programmed that. And they also did Time Tunnel. Jack Verson did that for the Commodore 64. If you like Jack's games, his earlier games, you'll like Time Tunnel as well. He did a really good job on that. And that brings us to the epilogue. What happened to On Time Software? Well, the video game crash happened. And On Time Software found no work for any of those companies at that time. Although the company stayed around until 2017. Believe it or not, it was still run by Cameron Schaefer all those years, and they did do programming and management consulting all those years after that. But the other programmers had left on time when that happened. Uh, what happened then? Well, uh, Joe Gachet and Fred Allen, Fred Allen was the roaming tech for Rockland. He's the one who did all the running around and the fixing of the, of the development systems. Forgot his name earlier. Uh, they went to a company called Metrobotics, and they developed the firmware for Teddy Ruxpin for Worlds of Wonder. So it was life after Rockland. Uh, Joe Helson, with his company Windy City Software, did some work later for Electronic Arts. He wrote the Commodore 64 version of Jordan vs. Bird one-on-one. -on -one. And he told me he got to meet Michael Jordan and Larry Bird, and he showed me the photos he has of him with Michael Jordan. He said it was a very fun project to work on. And those guys were really down to earth. Uh, he said Michael really took a great interest in the game to make sure it was good. He wanted it to be good, a really good game. He really had a lot of interest in it. And uh, the, a funny story is during the demo when uh, uh, Joe Helson played as Michael and he missed a few shots from outside, had some good inside shots, and Jordan said, yep, that sure sounds like me <laughs> at the time. So, <laughs> so. Well, I'll leave you guys with a quote from Joe Gachet. I asked him if he could be here today and address all of you and the people who still play his games. What would you say to them? Well, I hope you have a great time trying to find the end. <laughs> Which brings us to, I'll take questions now if you have any questions on anything I've covered so far, if anyone has any. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess I covered it pretty well then. Uh, a bit of a thing out there. Yeah, as it turns out, you know, Rockland created an awful lot of software for the industry, and not many people knew what they did. I mean, when I first found out about it, it really blew my mind. I mean, they did all of that because we never knew. I thought the Pac-Man was programmed at Atari. Well, it wasn't. Not that version. That was that was Rockland who did that. And uh, also, one little factoid: um, Ron did not share the royalties with the programmers. All that money I talked about. Uh, for Pac-Man, there was a royalty check of $36,000 that was due to each programmer, and uh, they never got it, so, unfortunately. Well, I thank you guys all for attending. It was fun researching this stuff. I said, I do have a table out there with Rockland uh, artifacts there. Those are the actual uh, computer that Joe programmed his games on is there, along with his actual 2600 he tested them on. I think that's pretty cool when you have to see stuff like that, okay? Take care, guys. We'll see you guys next year.